I had an abstract appreciation of invention. Uh, my dad, you know, gave me his copy of The Boy's Life of Edison and uh, brochures about Steinmetz, Charles Steinmetz, the great, and other luminaries at GE. But at that era, um, newsreels made fun of inventors pretty cruelly. Yeah, well, that was, you know, they, if you can remember way back, we would see newsreels even the tail end of them in theater. And one of their delights was to skewer people that came up with gizmos, usually foreign people who could try to defend their invention in an engaging foreign accent and then fail spectacularly because of flames, explosions, things falling apart, etc. And the comic books made fun of inventing uh, Donald Duck's uncle was called Gyro Gearloose, which gives you a, a sense of how much reverence they had for inventing. <laughs> so I, I recoiled from the whole idea, and I all I wanted to do was become an entertainer, a folk singer, which I did to my dad's disgust, because uh, I had to give up a very valuable scholarship in order to quit and and uh, go and be in the, you know in a folk group. Mm. And in fact, I couldn't just quit the scholarship. I the only way I could leave it it was a Navy scholarship. The only way I could leave without being a, uh, an enlisted man for four years was to flunk everything. If I quit, I was an enlisted man. Mm. Oddly enough, if I flunked everything, they just said go, be gone. So I did one of the best jobs I ever did in college was comprehensively flunking everything, and I got out. And did that for three years. Loved that job. Great job. But there must be some residual, at least, acknowledgement that inventing has its uses because I've I've actually been thinking about it. And the study cam wasn't the first attempt at inventing. Uh, and I realized that my little film company, very far from Hollywood, lumbered with big, heavy gear because that's what I thought I had to have. I learned my trade reading books about filmmaking in the library. Uh, I owned an 800 pound dolly. Uh, <laughs> I owned a bunch of really enormous studio lights, Mole Richardson and Bardwell and McAllister, giant, you know, Fresnels and big old lamp bulbs that had BBs in them that you had to swirl the BBs as you made out to get rid of the carbon now and that this yeah. is an early era. One step removed from arc lights in effect. And so um, in answer to local filmmaking problems, I, I invented a dog's eye view dolly for a commercial that ended up winning, winning a Clio, which is our Hutch top award for commercials at the time. Because it, was, it, turned, it yielded a spectacular eye view of a beagle waddling home to his great little woman there, you know. Mm. You're tired, Fred. Your collar's too tight. You got a great little woman there, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And the <laughs> dog's eye view leaned 45 degrees to pee on a hydrant that it had just passed. And that was regarded as hilarious and so on. And that was a single wheel with a, my Aeroflex out front and a counterweighted handle, a big, soft balloon tire with the air out of it that just bobbled along you know mm. and was oddly enough stable as hell because uh, of its length and into my brain went all those you know observations as i looked closely at the results of all these things and then i had a world war ii rommel era araflex still with its desert you know desert paint uh <laughs> od you know uh T desert paint under the black wrinkle that if it got dinged you could see the desert paint it was one of those yeah. rommel north african areas you know yeah but it was noisy and it occurred to me that you know if i that a vacuum might be the lightest way to stop its noise getting outside you know looking at underwater housings as an example you know mm. you don't need much of a so you don't need much around a camera. In fact, you want the least amount of space around it so it isn't too damn buoyant. 
you're underwater housing and you've got to feed a pass through through to you know control focus there were some analogs to what i was thinking of and i took my array to my old high school and my former physics teacher and i put it under a bell jar and sucked the air out and it was silent i was sitting on a rubber mat in a bell jar dead quiet you know so i commissioned a hapless would-be machinist first we were going to cover it with fiberglass and you know just wrap cloth around it and put fiberglass around it and that would automatically leave a void you know, and then cut that in half and seal it and put the two halves together like Magdeburg spheres if you know the reference you know that mm. that two spheres where they suck the air out of things about this big and two horses couldn't pull them apart you know that yeah. kind of thing and so all it all it would need is a uh, a valve and the pass through and a, a good solid optical flat in front of the lens and the halves coming apart. And so that when you needed to reload, you let the air out, you know, back into it, pull it apart, load it, clap it together, tuck it, tuck it, tuck it, suck the air out, and you're dead quiet. And I calculated it would add about five pounds to the weight of an air flip. You know, Jamie, this is an era when the blimp, which I declined to buy for the area, weighed 100 pounds and was quiet by virtue of lead foil and goat skin layers. You know? yeah. So it did strike me that this could be of great value in moving this. But the, um, that didn't amount to anything because along the path i had after i had given it out to be made in aluminum which this fellow wanted to do instead of fiberglass but to do that he would have to hog out two enormously heavy blocks of aluminum an awful lot of machining you know? right yeah and uh i encountered uh lee de forest that name ring any bells no. Lee DeForest was one of the most famous inventors in the 20s. He invented, um, let's see, what was it? An optical track recording, was it? Uh, I'm not sure. He, he invented the vacuum tube, among other things. Uh, that was his primary contribution. But he tossed off a minor invention and patented a camera and a bell jar to silence it. And so when I encountered that pattern, I thought, oh, damn, you know, I can't get anything, you know, any primary coverage. And I and my friend failed abominably to machine the blimp and claimed that it had been stolen from his house and laid his stereo out in the backyard to try and convince me that the thieves had been discovered and dropped his stereo, but made off with the vacuum blimp. So the combination of those two things, <laughs> like I gave it up, and I joke that you know, I've never seen the you know any sign that in a, a a pawn shop somewhere would ever be the remains of this vacuum blimp looking like two odd ashtrays or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so that that did not cure me of the idea of inventing, but it you know it was a little chastening. I'd spent a little money on it, you know. And you know what? What I didn't realize was I could have had a really powerful patent mm. on that, something I've learned since, because it included the idea of a filter to filter the air as it went back into the blimp, without which dust would be in every magazine immediately and it would be hopelessly mm. useless. And Lee DeForest's version would have been useless the instant he let the air back in because of dust. Mm. on the film you know so that little that one claim would have made it a valuable pet but i didn't know it at the time and <laughs> by the time i figured that out there was the you know panaflex which i admired mm -hmm. and the araflex bl i mean th those handheld cameras um that came they they freed up the the movement of the camera from being on a dolly but it gave us a perspective that wasn't quite what it was trying to to be which was the the point of view of a of a human being but your exactly. yeah. your invention went that step further to to replicate something that's more natural to us in the way that we see that there's this fluidity to it what what was the problem that you saw in the industry that you 
then managed to overcome with the Steadicam? And how did you do that? How did you get into that zone to be able to, to come up with that idea? Well, I know now a great deal more about the way we see and the, what the study cam actually accomplished than I did at the moments of trying to think it up and inventing it and prototyping it. And that was a long process. Uh, that was inspired by another invention, which was a camera that hung on a pole 30 feet below a helicopter so that I could shoot ground level stuff that, you, that, was, that I was hoping would be reasonably stable of the brand new Subarus or one of the early Subaru commercials mm. and then fly away, you know? And that was the moment that I was inspired to do. And that thing turned out to be a spectacular object. It was a foam ball. Even if you got it too low, it would just skid on the ground without mm. harm. Uh, and I was actually gauging the height of it by the pilot looking at the shadow of it, we shot it in an airport in Indio, California. And the shots are spectacular. And I had tested the idea with a couple of cameras on poles earlier and learned that they're astonishingly stable in tilt and roll because those are the long axes of the pole. But in pan, the early ones were very unstable because there was no inertia there, right? So. Mm -hmm. By the time I got to the Subaru commercial, I had a five-foot bar with a couple of weights, T-bar at the top of the thing, which settled it down a little bit in pan. And those shots are insanely stable and really, really interesting. And of course, the, the aha moment when you fly away is, is amazing. So uh, it was staring at the results of that that sent me along looking for poles. But what was my goal? My goal was I loved handheld. I hated the way it looked. I just wanted to be able to shoot stable handheld, you know, mm. without without then reference to the way humans see, you know, that came later mm. on a, a form of analysis that's still going on. I'm still figuring that out. You know? mm. But uh, the first ones that I made were, you know, fairly primitive T bars with weights. That, you know, and in each case, I shot some astonishing stuff. Uh, the T-bar with weights tilt rises when you tilt up. That annoyed me, as I've said many times. Mm -hmm. So uh, that led to a parallelogram version that had weights and that moved from, I wanted it to go floor to ceiling. That was part of the dream. Because I love what happens with the lens down low and up high, up overhead. And I wanted to go from one to the other. The study cam failed to deliver that initially because in order to get it to work in 35 millimeter, and I shot 16 stuff with that parallelogram that knocked their socks off in LA, but they all said, kid, comma, you have to do it in 35 millimeter. It won't be useful. And I hadn't revealed how it was done, but also looking at my long suffering operators with the parallelogram, which was hugely heavy and awkward mm -hmm. and had a, fiber optic viewfinder fairly terrible and and so on and i watched them stumbling across pastures with this thing and i thought that eh, you know, even if you could lift it it wouldn't be worthy and i went notoriously into a motel for a week to try and rethink the whole thing that did and came out with a, a plan that i was a little disappointed in because it would really the lens heights would really only go from the waist to over the head Mm. And that that is the primary weight, you know, height range for a study cam with two arm lengths in any way. Uh, and then there on, on Stanley Kubrick's behalf later came low mode, you know, flipping mm -hmm. it upside mm -hmm. down so that you go from the waist down to below the knees. But my goal was to let you be as agile as you are in life on your feet, which is a, the best, the ultimate dolly in the same way that a horse is the ultimate off-road vehicle, you know? Mm, mm. Um, it's and, great and watching Her you. Sorry. I was going to say, it's great oh. watching you on that, that demo reel, just absolutely legging it, running as fast as you can with the rig on. It must've been yeah. pretty exhilarating to it, realize the was, shots that you were getting. But we thought that it was a stunt device initially. Right. Mm. You know, because certainly that would be useful enough to be able to run and do stuff. Mm. And that stuff looked, 
you know, surprisingly good. The the plan that I came out of the hotel, the motel room with, was it. Mm. All study cams still are made that way. Four, there are four elements to the original patent, which was never busted, incidentally. It was an attempt? Yeah, Panavision yeah. ripped it off, but they lost them. Mm. And the lawsuit and ended up as a license. So the patent was remained uninfringed. Another couple of minor attempts were made and thumped down by my Swiss <laughs> patent attorney. Um, even a Japanese one, well funded, but eventually they capitulated with a comical English translation of you right, we wrong, we no do this again, kind of thing. Because mm. in that era, the document itself was almost like an illuminated manuscript and the translation was a crude typewritten document that accompanied it. <laughs> in any event, you just brought up something interesting mm. to me, which is, yeah, it, I thought it was a stunt device and it was in the demo we made for it, which became famous, that I realized that, hey, the stuff that I did walking looks fantastic mm. and walking and booming up and down and, you know, having the freedom not only of pan and tilt, which all us operators had, and the freedom to move through space if you and a dolly grip or crane operator were in sync, but the fact that you had it all, you know, you had within that range of heights, you had pan and tilt and three axes of translation just within the length of the arm, and then you had everywhere your feet could go. Mm, and mm. kneeling and you know sitting down on a box and being pushed and you know as as happened climb up on a crane with it or yeah race across the ground on a camera car and you your knees and this arm take out all the bad stuff you know yeah exhilarating is the word and the combination of bravado and i wouldn't say exhil exhilaration cut in when you saw the dailies for these early features Mm. The early, the early, my early four ways, forays were deeply um, frightening. Because mm. there you are with you know some alleged contraption that works on your you know on your pins with something that l looks crude and weird to everybody else. There's no reference, so there, there must be quite a lot of apprehension yeah. from crews when they first saw you with this thing. Like, who's this kid? Kind of, what, what's he doing here? Like, on Bound for well, Glory. You yeah, know, the minute they saw it in, yeah, when it came out of the box, yes, when they mm. saw it in motion, there was the beginnings of an understanding that that this might be all right. You know, the kid has some kind of gadget. You know, I used to, I once recall asking my wife Ellen, who was as girlfriend in all those demos, running up and down, including down the art museum steps, which proved and and eventually to be valuable. I remember asking her before Marathon Man. Do you think the grips will be annoyed with this thing, you know, in the sense that a lot of dolly track laying will go out the window if it becomes successful? And we couldn't answer that question. It, I didn't yet know that grips love, you know, helping study cam operators are our best friend on earth. And the, re the reason we stay alive and can do half this stuff is the, you know, the symbiosis between somebody guiding and keeping an eye out for you and, you know, steering you through hazards and so on and even catching you if you fall down in some notable instances you know but then once we got at it in the feature world the, the corresponding reward was what happened in dailies mm. which you know you could almost not imagine a more comprehensive satisfaction <laughs> and the first one was bound for glory that mm. shot of haskell's wexler's coming down off a crane and walking 300 feet with Carradine and Randy Greer, Randy Quaid, and uh, coming back with them and penetrating the crowd like a ghost with nobody looking at the lens with, and occupying apparently no space because mm. a human with this thing can slip through no gap at all. You know? The lens can go between two close heads who then just breathe apart. And they all were looking at my face, not at the lens. Hmm. And I had a lot of anxiety about the daily screening because Haskell's stuff was so brilliant, you know, and 
Right. He was so he was so insouciant and you know casual about the whole thing. Stick me up on a crane, you know. Everybody gathering around watching, followed through the crowd by an army of crew. You know, second take interrupted by an extra who came up to talk to David Carradine because this poor guy didn't recognize that me, who looked like I was carrying a sewing machine. <laughs> yeah was participating in this process. <laughs> He's used so, to a big crane following someone around, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> that take, of one of three, the first one was, you know, aborted. The crane thing defeated me the first time. Then the extra interrupt, and in between each take, I only had one rear throat magazine, so they had to shut the production down, go into the, into the trailer in the dark and reload this complicated pattern so those parties, the ADs and the assistants were kind of annoyed because they were I'm not used to have somebody showing up with one magazine. That just seemed folly to them, you know. Mm -hmm. But everybody piled into that screening room, as has been reported often. And I came in and went up to a guy and said, are you the projectionist? Hoping to get some kind of preview of what had happened. And he very coldly looked at me and said, no, I'm the producer. So <laughs> I slunk to the back of the room and made myself small and sat there watching all of Haskell's great stuff. And then this shot came up and just knocked them on their ass. Wow. And there was a silence and then yelling, applauding, standing, <laughs> yelling Haskell's name. I mean, everybody there, including me, had an inkling that, Things were ch had changed. You know? mm. My life, in particular, you know, that was something. If you have more than one moment like that in a lifetime, or even one, you're lucky. You know? mm. you know, I'm just thinking if if that had been shot and in uh, if that had been dramatized, the shot of you with everyone reacting around you would be done on a steady cam, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah, and much else. <laughs> It's actually more prevalent, more successful now, 48 years later than ever. You know, it's still growing. And a new study cam invention called the Volt, I don't know if you've caught on to that one, but mm -hmm. the Volt is a little accessory for the gimbal with a brilliant sensor. I allied myself with a great electronics guy named Steve Wagner and got him a license with Tiffin. And Tiffin backed this idea to the hilt and is selling thousands of this Volt thing, which just claps onto the gimbal of anybody's study camp, pretty much, and keeps it level. Mm -hmm. And level keeping was one of those housekeeping chores that was really annoying about study camp opera. You had to learn to do that. And it occupied some brain power while you're shooting. You know? We got great at it and we did it well, but having that done for you is. It's as if you were playing a violin that would never stay in tune and suddenly it automated and was, was in tune. And it's all done with two little motors and a sensor and a, and a counter. It's clever as hell and it weighs a couple of pounds. Doesn't affect the build, so-called. Doesn't make your rig taller or shorter. And suddenly you're able to operate in neutral balance, which is the first time we've really practically been able to do that. And that's ideal because you can hurl it around and it doesn't change the angle of things. Because it's still a mechanical, you know, ex mm. exquisitely balanced inert object. And now you can operate it with no bottom heaviness. So that's good. But what was it about those directors back in what 76 i mean I've, I've i had a short foray into the film industry when i worked for a company that supplied editing solutions so i was installing steenbecks and early avids and early lightworks and i'd come from tv and i was amazed at how antiquated the the, the film industry was that it stayed you know pretty much the same the processes stay pretty much the same for you know almost 100 years and there's that traditionalism in the in the film industry that kind of stops progress. It's particularly in that period, I think, in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. So what what was it about those directors, you know, Hal Ashby and Avildsen, that they saw something in the Steadicam and they were bold enough to, to take it forward and put it in their movies? I've, pu I've puzzled over that. I imagined, of course, that I, since I owned this magic device, that I would work every day. Mm. And that was not the case. The phone did not ring for long periods of time. 
because it was only the bold souls, uh, those that had enough self-confidence that went for it. But you're right, the, the business was quite conservative. It had come out of a studio system that was designed to almost maintain that status quo and control yeah. uh, with a hammerlock on everybody and everything, including actors and actresses under contract you know, to studios, those entities. And they were not particularly forward thinking operations because they liked the way things worked. And they had, you know, a lot of big, expensive old gear that, you know, could go on craning forever, you know. Um, However, what escaped my notice when I was learning my trade in the library was that the whole business was edging out onto location. You know, Mm. the Elemac, I believe, had just been invented. Little dollies that you could, Mm. you know. Um, Faoud Saeed had his film what was it called? Film mobile, cine mobile. Fahoud Saeed had cine mobile, which was trucks that had a little crane platform on the roof and it was a van and it had enough gear for this new lightweight 16 millimeter eclair camera, you know, slightly faster film world to go out on location and everything you needed was in this van. You know, see, that was the idea. Uh, I lumbered myself with a heavier than normal dolly 800 pounds my crews were were tormented by having to lift it onto pickup trucks to take on location with my five seconds of rusty ass rail you know (laughs) four straight and one curved you can imagine those shots you know and my camera pinheadedly on it a bolex with a you know 24 second spring wind so my version of the Hollywood, great Hollywood dolly shots was, was constrained and a bit odd. <laughs> and, and, and it was so irritating, that dolly. And yet handheld, every time I tried it, was disappointing. I had, you know, I am a, something of a fetishist for, as it turns out, something that looks like we see, you know. Mm. We have, as you hinted earlier, it's widely known now that we have a, a wonderful computer in our heads that stabilizes what we see, startlingly stabilizes. It's processing on the order of what goes on in, a, in an iPhone and beyond. You know, mm-hmm. the iPhone in, is almost a cheating competitor to traditional cameras because it's all done with with processing mm-hmm. and you know wonderful stability tricks and over scans that they can make use of and a processing speed that's so blindingly fast that they can, you know, even while you're shooting it, you almost can see it looks as it will, you know, mm, mm. they've just released cinematic mode on the iPhone yeah. 13. Have you had a look at it? It's I haven't. No, good. I've seen the demos, but I haven't seen it in person. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, forget bokeh and beautiful lenses and 50 mil true depth of field under the science of optics. They simply made it look great by, <laughs> using several little views and muddying it up and making it look, you know, soft. And there you are in your hand mm. is this wonderfully democratic instrument now, you know, I actually, I could show you this actually, would you, if you care to see it, maybe we yeah, should use the, you can use the video on this. I actually made a, the smallest study cam ever made, patented it, the whole works. Well, Your eyebrows just what is what's left of them just what's went left up. Of my eyebrows went up. Yeah, I don't have just eyebrows. went up a little bit. So, <laughs> wow. Uh, I wanted it to weigh the same as an iPhone to be in your pocket, mm. to be able to come out of your pocket and uh, huh. hold the camera, you know, and you be able to operate it. Pay. Of course, it won't look very good without a camera but you get the idea it's yeah, weighted yeah. It, it, yeah. it's a perfect counterweight it weighs bloody nothing <laughs> that's very cool so you may ask where is this thing why did this not ever get made yeah because because i lectured at apple a few times to the group responsible for putting the stability into iphones and it, they didn't give away anything they were doing, but watching the progression, it was clear to me that 
you know, it's a somewhat more of a pain to have to pull that thing of mine out of your pocket, open it up, put the camera on it, you know, make a few balance tweaks before you can shoot as compared to, yeah, you know, you're there. Mm -hmm. And as that, that has proved out the 13, you can walk pretty, pretty successfully with it. You know, mm. It's not as good as the camera on the little Volt study cam that we've made recently for, mm. for, uh, phone cameras but it's damn good you know and so i think we made the right call not to spend the fortune tooling up for it and building it and trying to sell it for 150 bucks no yeah you know, the, the discretion was way better than valid in that <laughs> case. people do get scared of these these innovations and these changes in consumer end products as well don't they i know a bunch of steady cam ops in, and they look at an osmo pocket and I can see that they're, you know, simultaneously kind of balking at it, but also going, shit, you know, somebody could knock off some pretty steady shots pretty quickly, pretty cheaply. Was there ever a time during those early years of Steadicam where you had that that same sort of protectionist kind of view where you thought, let's keep this amongst an elite group of us um, and keep it all in-house? Yeah, it was early on, it was proposed, I, I had demoed the 16 millimeter demo to general camera mm. and those guys loved the results and they wanted, they were the Panavision licensee, but they wanted to license this separately because they were annoyed with Panavision and uh, only have one and it would work for 20,000 a week and it would have black cloth on it and hide the detail. And I, I'm just so thrilled to this day that I had the wit to not go with that arrangement, you know, because as I've told operators early on, when I would teach some of my early, you know, some of the greats, you know, Larry McConkey learned his trade in my townhouse, you know, making dings on our doorways when he failed to <laughs> glide through. And everybody said, Oh God, don't teach anybody else. This is a great racket. You know, and I, I have, I understood that, for instance, if you were the only violin player in the world, you'd be in a circus, mm. right? But if there yeah. are a hundred thousand violin yeah. players and you're good, that's where the, you know, long black limos and C note per diems <laughs> come in. You know? In other words, it's the more there are out there, the more their energy broadens the market. And that has proved to be true. Every good shot made anywhere in Bangalore or, you know, or Djibouti, mm opens the eyes of that crowd, you know, to an extent and sends them in a direction that's useful for us, you know? And so I'm not that, not, wasn't then or now that worried about infringement, except that we heard that there was a study cam killer invention coming along and very early on. And it what turned out to be the Luma crane and whoever was passing that, bit of nonsense around thought that that <laughs> somehow would you know yeah, get man. rid of study camp mm. and that wasn't not even the technocrine just the luma you know which steven spielberg had a lot of fun with on 1941 you know? mm. no i even now people say you know is study cam doomed you know because there are gimbals now right of all sizes and, uh and so on and that but they've been saying that for for many years and in fact, a two-man crew, gimbal and wheels operator, by gimbal I'm referring to the, you know, the motorized versions, mm -hmm. the Ronins and so on, they're stupidly stable for sure, but they're appalling for operators. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, even if you have a tight two-man crew and somebody's on the wheels and you've just become a glorified grip, when you walk along, it's really hard to not reflect your steps holding it because you're fully loaded your hands mm. you know therefore they're a very strong conduit of what you're doing um, the combination of the arm which is essentially frictionless within that sphere that you can reach means that you can be doing this as you saw in that original demo and it does that mm -hmm. and and the ability to move it gracefully through space as a fingertip operation has still not been, you know, achieved by any of those things. So, and the fact that you can be something of an athlete with this thing, 
slipping through narrow spaces, having behind you, around you, you could be on any side of it you wish to be. You're not stuck behind it, you know, with your arms getting tired, you know. This sounds like a commercial for study camp, but what I'm really, I'm really reciting the ways in which it is virtuous for moving the lens where you would ideally want it in French curves that would drive a dolly grip crazy, you know, but are exactly what you want on screen, you know. Yeah, You're I was watching in, Rocky in, again yesterday. I watched Rocky again yesterday, and that scene through the meat locker where you're just backing through yeah. the the beef hanging there. and That's a great example. Yeah. yeah, you don't really realise until you look at films that preceded that 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 shot is, is spectacular because it reveals the, the set to us or reveals the real location to us. It adds dimension to it. That's what the Steadicam does, doesn't it? It adds a, a 3D doesn't effect. It, yeah. Um, yeah, sure. That's and, the most primitive reason that it's built, that I love it, that we love it. You know, the three yeah. D effect is is that is what happens when you move through space. Your left and right eyes now, you know, even one eye, and you know, in two D, if you're moving through space, you're giving the effect of the left and right eyes, and you are able to. Your brain tells you the the dimensionality of things that doesn't mm. exist in in two D if you're state static. You know. Mm. Yeah, no, it, it that and the fact that you can pretty much go anywhere ahead, behind, you know, pulling out of the way and back in in ways that you can't even tell on screen. Mm. Uh, even somebody just sitting down, you know, the fact that you can drop at the same speed or allow them preferentially to drop a little faster than you and catch up a little because that just looks better. If you drop at the same speed, it appears that the background rose behind them. But if you allow them a little bit of tilt in the process to stick with them, suddenly it, it's clear what you did, and yet you're not looking down at the top of their head. You know? Yeah, there, there, there are aspects of art that we're still discovering. And I'm such a pussy. I'll sit there and just watch a movie and not even think about study cam. And Ellen will give me an elbow and go, wow, look at that. <laughs> and then I go and go, wow, that's good. Who is that? You know, <laughs> in the early days, we knew all the names. Mm -hmm. We started the study cam operators association in 1988, Nicola Pecorini and I, the great Italian operator mm -hmm. started it. And for a while knew, you know, everybody. But that's that's long gone. You know, Happily everybody still knows gone. you, Gary. I know, I know a bunch of steady cam operators, and of course they all know you. One one name, of course, which is big in your catalogue of movies as well, Stanley Kubrick, um, on The Shining, obviously the one of the films that really made the the steady cam sting uh, sing, I should say. Um, how early on do you think both, Stanley? Both actually. Yeah, yeah. How do you think? How early on do you think Stanley? had in mind the use of the Steadicam for that film, because it feels that you, that film couldn't have been achieved without it. Well, you must have, or I would imagine you've seen reprinted the telex that he sent us. Have you ever seen yeah. it? Yeah, I've seen yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Stanley, uh, that demo in, went what amounts to viral, but in 35 millimeter of all things, you know, sent laboriously and mailed around the world, eventually was seen by all the hotshots. Stanley saw it right. He got it one of the early copies in 35 millimeter. There were do several dozen dubs made of it in 35. And Stanley sent back a thrilling telex that said, you know, mystery stabilizer is spectacular. I can almost memorize it. You can count on me as a customer, blah, blah, blah. And he said, because uh, he had a fine eye for stuff like this and loved to show off, he said, uh, you may want to eliminate the 14 frames that show a shadow of it on the ground that reveal that there's something, you know, slowly rotating and blah, blah, blah. Of course, we were horrified. We ran into the screening room and yes, they were, we cut them out. You know? um, but Stanley immediately saw its utility and he, we think, had the galleys for Stephen King's Shining because he closed the telex asking, is there a minimum height at which it could be used? And he had a real, a real dilemma because to make a set the size of the overlook, which flowed one to another through six or eight stages, mm. 
you there is no way on earth to make floor good enough to roll anything across uh you know even a dolly if you don't have you know if you haven't laid down you know milled planks or rails or something like that you cannot roll a dolly down those those carters made of conventional construction and the look of those shots that he got trying to put them on wheels must have been deeply dismaying because that you know the hotel's eye view of all eye views is sort of what those shots are you know mm-hmm. pinioned in the center and moving you know like this and uh if that's not smooth i can imagine that was vexing it was vexing enough to stanley that he bought a dushavo you know a 2cv citroen that has they have amazing suspensions stripped everything off of it but a wooden platform in the back and a steering wheel so that the grips could push this thing and hopefully the suspension would allow it to be stable and the reports and it was there it was hanging around when i came to visit the reports were that it was just it just turned the period into a bigger longer oscillation that was out of control so i was um you might say timely for that movie and mm-hmm. and the result was those shots that are you know eerily centered and and have an effect you know, mm-hmm. plunging through space the 3d effect but some of the partaking of some of the other reasons why moving camera shots is so satisfying the kinetics you know just the pure joy of mm. plunging through space that of course the 3d effect in the primitive side but the emotional wall because moving is not simply you know clicking a switch and you're going exactly 11.1 miles an hour or whatever it is moving partakes of accelerations and decelerations each one individual you know uh i mean that you know doing this as i as i frighten people in workshops you know that <laughs> is a Some is an zoom. excellent an exclamation point you know that is mm. a emotionally stark and strong whereas this mm. has another character altogether and on and on and on the way you move and not only forward and back but vertically and sideways and in curves and so on and in com- combination with pans that come and go and sometimes yield you looking to the rear and sometimes to the front and then whip pans which we devised years later you know mm. like i could no i could play with the camera and <laughs> oh, <I'm> sorry <laughs> <laughs> how difficult was it chasing danny around on that on that trike then it was cuz he he's going a fair old lick there isn't he <laughs> yeah he is and and as the great and late uh, winkle our grip pointed out the kid's tireless stanley i can't keep up he's <laughs> fucking tireless <laughs> which he was apparently you can ride one of those plastic big wheels for an eternity without fatigue <laughs> uh, however i took one look at that and realized that if i tried to run those things and i knew by the time we got to that that stanley liked a lot of takes so i'd been on the hunt for wheeled vehicles that i could ride on something that you'll recognize in the uk but nobody in the us will know what it is a sack barrel mm-hmm. tried tried that terrible um tried every form of dolly but they can't be you know pushed as fast or with a with a safety that would be required trailing right after a kid we ended up on the wheelchair that stanley had had ron ford build in which was just wheels and it could be constructed in any direction so he could sit on it handheld so on. and i could hard mount to that thing and you know kneel on it and get the lens 1 inch above the floor which is a fabulous lens height and there was you know my ari had no no uh, motor under it the motor had been displaced to the side by a de julio so i literally could skim the floor with a mat box and the only problem then devolved to poor winkle and his teams of relay replacements that came in to run that around and originally it had Dougie Wilson my assistant on it and a and a light and that totally defeated the pushers 
So we, we ended up without that. I started earlier to say that all this freedom of 360s and so on also transferred some of the issues to to people like, uh, you know, the DPs, you know, that mm. had to figure out a way to light like that. Um, mm. Names go flying in out of my head. Uh, the great late. Uh, o- the o- shiny. John yes. O- John, John very cleverly had everything on dimmers and you know he simply would dimmer up the stuff behind the actors and down the stuff behind me mm-hmm. and as i rolled around he would simply swap that so it was always everybody was always somewhat backlit and looked great you know mm-hmm. and then he had those giant um sidewalls with marlock marlocks and you know up to a thousand thousand watt pars looking through marlocks which gave the impression of, you know, that entire window full of very white out daylight, you know, and that light had a great character as well. And I could look, yeah, I could look straight at it. They put some stunted little pine trees at the bottom that barely exposed and you, you believed it entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some of those issues also prevailed in the little apartment, you know, there was no way to have any lighting instruments in there at all, but, Watching my video assistant running the dimmers up and down just did a great job. And John would at times come up behind me with a solid flag and create a solid shadow behind, you know, mm. in place of my up to all too human shadow. And that felt fine on the set. You know, it didn't, didn't feel like a problem. So those problems were pretty comprehensively solved during the shining, you know, mm. Right. Yeah, the peripherals, but you know, the job is an auteur kind of job at best, and to you know to have the grips and the DPs and the you know the gaffers and so on involved in the process is great, just mm. great. Mm. It becomes its own form of bravura filmmaking. You know? mm. Yeah, I've I've seen you talk about how you really learnt your trade on on The Shining because of being under the direction of of Stanley Kubrick and his famous uh, multiple takes. What was it? 147 takes for the Scatman Carruthers and, and Danny scene. 148. In the kitchen. Yeah. Is it 148? <laughs> yeah. And each one was seven minutes long. <laughs> and each take had two or three cameras running. So there were a lot of short ends involved with that mm. because those thousand footers yielded a 300 foot short end, which was not Stanley didn't want to use them. And I took many of them for experiments for another notion that I had that never mm. turned into something. But I, I was obsessed with dreaming up a human powered transportation thing. So I shot myself and others walking in 35 millimeter to analyze what you're really doing when you're walking. So mm. they, I got all those short ends. It was fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have brought them home for our commercial activity. Yeah, you've um, you've talked as well about the the way the Steadicam turns, particularly in The Shining, and how it co- contributes to that kind of spooky serenity. I think you called it because you can kind of take a racing line. You've said as well through exactly. the turn. Being exactly. a motor yeah. racing person myself, I know what that means. You know, trying to make the the straightest line between two points essentially yeah um, it's the line that pulls the fewest g's you know mm, centri- centrifugally yeah but it's also what you as a runner would do another another instance of you know what an entity would do mm, what a dolly mm. would do is have to get there and maintain some space on either side and then make a turn mm. what the study cam could do particularly in the maze was to cut past stuff mm. you know and and that was really satisfying, immensely satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> there was not any satisfaction other than that in shooting that maze scene indoors. Um, it was hot. Mm. It was 100 degrees in there. You know? <laughs> and it was bright orange to the eye because those were uncorrected landscape lights. Mm in close proximity to super dried out pine needles so that we were always afraid of fire Mm. in there and styrofoam for snow. And of course it would have been a toxic fire if it had ever gotten lit and we would have been lost. Mm. 
totally lost because we never knew where we were. They had to send in people with maps and hunt us down between takes because you can't keep track in a you know featureless place like that of where the hell you are. You know, the only distinctive place in it was the so-called central alley, and if you got in there, then you knew at least where you were, but not what direction you were. Crazy. It was it was something. Uh, I met. I had managed to acquire a wireless, illegal wireless video transmitter, mm. which is where some of those Monty Python women imitations came from. Because <laughs> Stanley would was very interested that it not escape the studio, the, the image, and I reassured him because there was wire mesh on the studio wall that that would be a Faraday cage; it wouldn't get out. You know. <laughs> He was new enough to be dangerous about many subjects, but he, he recognized that expression. So he said, all right. And then he said, show me. Unfortunately, I had determined for myself the previous day that there were places where the image was perfectly visible outside the studio, but they came and went here and there. And I had, I had made note of them anyway, so I was able to steer Stanley around outside the <laughs> other places, not those places. But then Dougie and I went off, you know, imitating the housewives who would watch us every morning, you know. Ooh, you know, it must be the 24 Distagon. Ooh, <laughs> it's vignetting round the edges. Poor Mr. Bright, look at those 24 takes. Oh, my. <laughs> and he sadly hated that. We couldn't help ourselves. <laughs> I, I bet you, you had to kind of reprogram yourself to work for Stanley, though, just in terms of those multiple takes. You know, you... You, having worked on other films, you might get like like you said with the the path, a Bound for Glory um, shot. You had three takes of that big shot. Yeah, and with yeah. Stanley having fifty, sixty, a hundred, maybe. How difficult, therefore, was it to to get into that mode and then to get out of that mode once you went back to more conventional directors? That's a good question. Uh, I never went beyond about forty, mm. uh, and I quickly realized that it was a pure gift for me those takes because. They weren't, they weren't difficult at all because each take was separated by a three-minute playback mm. to my fortunate, thank God, video transmitter. And then a frequently three-minute argument about where the crosshair should be or you know what to do. And those, that was Stanley's time to reflect on what was happening. And seeing it back was part of the process. And the reasons that he did another one might have included that he hadn't figured out what to do next or was waiting for an idea or hoping that, you know, something electric would happen in a take, which did happen at times. But for me, it was pure joy. You know, I could have gone on doing it forever, literally. I mean, I, I was in great shape. I, you know, I didn't care. And I realized that every take got better. Hmm. The first five, you know, after five, I, they were fine. Anybody else on earth would have said fine. At take 14, you know, even Stanley, you know, if pressed would admit that there was no flaw in the take because by then I was on rails. But then right on, you know, on up into the 30s, I would realize for each take that, good Lord, if my if I stick this foot, for, just hold around the corner and put my foot here, I can actually get a little farther to the right here or mm. whatever, you know, it's some switch. And the, 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 uh, classic was this shot following uh, following um, Wendy up three flights of steps preceding her mm -hmm. slowly with her brandishing the knife and scared coming up three flights of steps with music and so on and they had a rig that was to rise up the middle of the staircase and rotate with her as she went around but the results weren't all that great but I was able to climb those stairs 35 times, three flights. It's the equivalent of climbing the Empire State Building in a yeah, day right. with the study camp. It was totally easy, you know, because you go up three flights, then you have, you know, six minutes of, of rest. Um, I literally, I think, almost could have done it forever. And hmm. they did keep improving. And it was a staggeringly good shot, you know just in those terms. It swept close to and almost over those railings. 
you know. Hmm. Uh, and they they gave you a reference, the railing slipping by your shot, which fed back to not, you know, moving so that the railings would appear to move. I mean, that's a shot that I think about a lot because a lot of that stuff had never been seen, would have been totally impossible. Mm. Yeah. How, how amazing to have been gifted that uh, that chance to refine your craft to that extent that, you know, would only oh, exist in maybe on the stage for an actor who's done a, a show a hundred times or something. Precisely, mm. precisely. Yeah. And that's very insightful, Jamie, because that's what it felt like. I felt like I was a trooper on Broadway and, it, you know, the hundredth performance, I realized I can get even a little closer to the stage edge or whatever, you know. I mm. can be bolder here. Uh, and then by the time we got out into the maze and then back into that maze set, you know, we were a very well-oiled machine. And I, mm. you know, I knew what I was doing pretty much by then. And I, I by then realized that the key to study cam was to teach people how to do it, lot, as many as possible, and came out of there knowing just enough to, to teach people. So that was good. Yeah. You talked in, well, I don't know if it was in Labruto's book or... You talked somewhere about the hospital scene in The Shining and how that was the best shot that you pulled off in that whole shoot. And, of course, it's the scene that was then removed after the, the screening, the initial screening. What what was it about that scene and that shot that seemed like perfection to you? Well, first of all, Jenny, I'm very impressed with the homework you've done. You know, you, you're not a slacker at this. Thank you. You've turned up some references that... Are pretty obscure. That's very good. <laughs> good. I'm of course, we've that. delayed doing this long enough that you get plenty of time. But... <laughs> if you just said yes straight away, I would have been screwed. But... <laughs> no, no, no. I've learned I... never to do it. <laughs> no, fact, I've I regret your stuff even, for years, I, I, regret, I regret even doing it today because if we waited another year, you'd even know more. You know? <laughs> yes, the hospital scene was cut out of The Shining after the first screening in New York, which I attended. The critics pasted the film. And Stanley Reek was very upset about it, reportedly very upset, and immediately cut that scene out of it. Uh, and I can't comment on the, uh, I can't comment on, you know, whether that scene deserved to be in the movie or not. I remember it somewhat, but from the point of view of shooting it, Wendy is in a, you know, in a hospital bed, and Danny is there, and doctors are coming in and out, and there was some wrap-up dialogue and so on. But the work was spectacular. Some of the best stuff I've ever shot was in there because I was at, at the top of my game, you know, uh, the Paganini of my instrument. And uh, and I, it was the farewell sequence. I literally departed for the, for the plane the night after finishing that shot, said farewell to Vivian and everybody hugs all around, even a awkward semi-embrace with Stanley <laughs> and adios and seeing it in New York I you know I could appreciate the, the the technical virtuosity of it and was quite surprised that it ended up being being cut out and in fact when I was given an honor of sorts by the Lugano Locarno Film Festival um, for a treat we arranged to try and find a print that had that sequence still in it. And Warner Brothers um, said they had one and said they had shipped it to us. And unfortunately for all of us, I introduced it with the idea that, that this is a treat. This has never been seen since the New York screening year, blah, blah, blah. And the film ran and it wasn't there. <laughs> And uh, I think Vivian is very ardent at protecting Stanley's legacy, and it was his intent to lose it. So she was a voice for removing it. And I, you know, I can't blame her. You know, that the logic of it is intact. Stanley probably wouldn't have liked it being shown, but it was too bad that you know we didn't know that in time because it was a little bit embarrassing to not have it there. Uh, so I have literally never seen it since. Mm. Mm. Yeah, they are very protective. You know, I think about when I think about The Shining, I not only think about yours, your fantastic work, and 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 you know Kubrick's fantastic vision, but also that behind the scenes documentary that Vivian shot, 
And I believe there are still maybe 20 to 30 hours of that just still sat in cans in the archive in South London here. It will never see the light of day, which is... No, is and there have been a number, of, a number of attempts. Mm. Uh, and some of them, you know, I think Vivian isn't that interested that it be shown any more than what was in the film, which her dad mm. approved of. Mm. And she's she's been, you know not exactly cherished by the rest of her family. Mm. And I won't go into any, any of that mm. except to say that, you know, she's still out there defending Stanley ardently, yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah. there, <clears throat> I think the estate's interest is skewed slightly more commercial than that, but you know, they have a marvelous asset and it's a completely unique body of work. And it's a, a total insanity and a, vast shame that stanley died at 70 yeah and he died of something entirely you know that could have been identified and repaired yeah um so they were kind of asleep at the switch i guess and you know taking care of him in that sense and he wasn't taking care of himself so no, no. That, that's a shock i i don't happen to believe that eyes wide shut is anything like the movie he would have released three months later it was a highest numbered avid cut i would have guessed or some such that they plucked yeah. up and released it with his scratch piano track on it mm -hmm. you know, who knows mm -hmm. what it, what it would have looked like or sounded like you know yeah well, that's too bad maybe one day we'll find out maybe there'll be something buried somewhere some notes somewhere about it um i was one of the other th films i think about when i think about you and your, your steady cam is return of the jedi because those speeder bike shots completely unconventional way to use the steady cam in a way that that thinking outside mm. the box was dennis muran was it that first approached you um they asked if it could be done and it turned out that i had done it uh i had done it for a documentary on a, a tourist documentary on ireland mm. and and had attested the idea on streets of um, study cam running at a super low speed and using its stability to, you know, control the, the way the shot looked. And I had also made a documentary uh, with a camera mounted in a motor home that drove 8,000 miles around the U.S. And for a climactic uh, narration segment, eight minutes long in an ecology film, uh, I delivered them you know, edited this eight minute tour at 800 miles an hour down mm -hmm. the roads of the U S and that one was stable by virtue of the fact that they were effectively long exposures for each frame. And so that predominantly you would be pointed in the same direction. So the impression was that there's a vast amount of blurring out to the side for you. That would be like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the center more or less holds, you know, and it was a really great looking thing. So I was able to show them that. And we decided that it would be worth testing. And I made my Arri run at one frame per second and walked through the redwoods and they, they liked the results. So we, we went for it. Um, and I was imagining that it was easy for them to make use of it. Uh, George informed me later at Haskell Wexler's birthday that, it wasn't all that easy. They had to jump through a lot of hoops to get it to look as good as it did. But, you know, there were only three possible plans, and this was one of them, and the other two were fiercely expensive. One was a, a you know, 300-foot-long model of a forest that the Dykes Reflex would have sailed mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. The other was to lay rails through the forest you're shaking your head already. Yeah. Uh, how, but how the do you plan them, was, yeah. <laughs> to, well, you, you scatter leaves yeah. over them, you know, yeah. and you, you, you reverse the shot so that you've swept the leaves away, but you know, the mm. reverse shot sees the, sees the mm. leaves. It would have been immensely laborious and not nearly as flexible as what we did. And, and there's a little bit of vibration in that shot that feels sort of right. You know, it feels like a vehicle is hurtling through there trying to shoot that. So we're, we all ended up quite happy with it. And I started to hear rumors that this was a fantastic sequence, you know, well before the film was released. So, uh, they, and they did a, a wonderful job with the 
you know, the foregrounds, matted in. So the lighting on those and the, the direction and so on was really great. Muran is a for, formidable character. Yeah, I um I remember seeing that at the Dominion Theatre here in London on my birthday and as a treat. And uh, I remember going back to my grandparents that night and that's the scene I spoke about again and again. I just couldn't believe that it was real, you know, and it was real to me as a, as a six or seven year old. Yeah. And curiously, um, when they effectively redid it as the pod race in the first of the CGI ones, and let me say parenthetically by right now that in my whole career of about a hundred films, I never shot a, a green screen scene in any one of them. And uh, they were all film, not not digital. I did, you know, I had retired by the time digital penetrated to that extent. Uh, so everything I shot was real. It was models or, you know, it was stuff, real stuff. The pod race wasn't nearly as gripping as the speeder bike chase. And yet it was much faster, much more hairy and full of stunts and, you know, uh, alarms and crashes and impossible shit. Mm-hmm. And it, it was effectively a cartoon compared to the speeder bike chase. Yeah. Speeder bike chase was sort of grounded in a just barely reality somehow. Yeah. Agreed. And the pod race had launched beyond. And you might say the same thing about the, about the, um, rope bridge scene, you know, yeah. in Indiana Jones. Mm. Yeah. Because we shot it on a real rope bridge at a hundred degrees, you know, Fahrenheit and 100% humidity built by a mining or a dam building company up the river concealed their stain, you know, their steel wire ropes underneath fake rope and bounding around like an impossible object, you know, just totally, totally out of control. Uh, But it was 380 feet above the river. The CGI boys would have made it a thousand feet and they would have made the boards even farther apart why not you know mm. and therefore it suddenly approaches a cartoon you don't buy it if it yeah. gets no mm. yeah i just watched uh, again in in my research and i've seen it before that little snippet of you and steven on the bridge there harrison just pelting it across in one go because you know he has balls of steel or he's a maniac who knows and you and steven steven talking about how he thought that you and you and he were were very wise because you wouldn't go out any further than kind of forty yards because you could, you, you had a, yeah that's an understandable that's actually, fear. T- no, no, it's totally wrong. He's Is projecting it? his own feelings. Right, I, and I was I was everywhere on that bridge yeah. and running, and Stephen was very reluctant to go out on it. Didn't like it and. We had all said, "Well, is it safe?" Because there are these slender boards with about this much room in between each one. You know, you couldn't walk sideways; your feet would go down. You had to walk toe and heel straight ahead, even if you're turning. You know, like a ballet dancer, you had to plie your ass back the other way. You know? <laughs> and um, Stephen said, "Yes, these are flame hardened boards." And in fact, the board did break under Harrison, who was quite really? annoyed by it, and his leg went down to the crotch in the in the thing. And then no other board broke, fortunately. And we were all shut down where the heaviest grips jumped on every board and found a couple more that broke and replaced them with even more flame hardened boards. <laughs> and then we went back to running on it, you know. Right. And I have to hand it to Harrison. He went back and just did it, you know, and I did it right behind him, you know. Except I weighed sixty pounds more than he did with the yeah. study camp. So I wasn't quite as overjoyed uh, by the whole thing after that incident, you know. I was under joy. You must have been asked to do shots that in the early years you thought, yeah, I'm going to do this because it's going to help with the progression and the sale and the, the, yeah, no, you yeah, know, yeah. the evolution yeah. of it. But yeah. what, what were, when did the point come where you thought maybe I shouldn't be saying yes to everything? No, I got in trouble with that attitude because I both was the operator Mm. but also the you know involved in its success and so i wanted it to succeed and i did not want to say no that's not good it's not safe um and i've done things and had falls and accidents 
more than one that might have been fatal just from that you know degree of bravado which was very unwise uh i've gotten myself into into trouble and and i've managed to survive a couple of things that that, that were really just dumb you know out of that exact desire to promote the thing you know uh i mean running in places that weren't scouted or agreeing to become a crash box because i could sit on an apple box and let a stunt car come hurtling toward me and then leap out of the way you know we didn't have a crash box and that car didn't go right and did not flip and came bounding along and i had the newly designed quick release on mm. and the stunt guy who was helping me released me and hauled me out of there and the car squashed my rig in mm. a, a tv movie you know so i was i should have been chastened by that but i have fallen running you know yes somewhat mm. hazardous particularly if you're if you're if you're careless you know I had knee pads on and fell so hard on one movie that I that I hurt my knee. I agreed to do stupid stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, ah. You're clearly somebody who has uh, an amazing technical ability as well as, as well as a, an artistic vision and understanding of the science, the the art, and all of that stuff that's involved in in inventing something like the Steadicam. And also, you know, you've got your your dive cam and you have your um, Moby cam and Sky cam and all those things. What is it that drives you? Have you ever done any analysis on what is it that, that drives you to to come up with these um, these inventions? Because is it is it are you engaging the emotional level of what the shot can give now? Yeah, I mean, exactly. you said initially yeah, love, with the steady cam, you love didn't. The but, shot. Yeah, I love the shots. I love the way they look. I love. What I love about Skycam is the shots. The shots are fantastic. And some of those shots didn't get, you know, well, we, some of them we, we did early on, right away, and demos just went right for it. And early games have some great shots. But since then, there are wonderful crews on Skycam. And it's a, that's a two-man phenomenon. Somebody moves it around up and down, and somebody pans and tilts. And if they're joined at the hip, intellectually and artistically boy the results can be great because they're they're shooting something that is not planned and so it's their agility mental and, and you know physical agility that keeps it keeps it with them you know mm. amazing absolutely amazing stuff and it, i think it's the shots i just love i just love the shots you know? mm. uh, i then i love them so much that i get into them and don't even think about how they're done anymore as i said but mm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, we having worked on motorsport for years, and I've been on the Olympics and world athletics and things, so I've seen many of these these inventions. And I think sometimes there's a kind of disconnect between what the shot can offer and what it's doing. You know, what it's doing emotionally. Um, and I, I and saw you sometimes talk... may I say, may I interrupt and mm. say that sometimes that's an editorial matter in television because. We shot, for example, a thing called Live Aid, if you'll recall that concert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We shot the, the U.S. edition, which was in Philadelphia. Mm. Yeah. And we made some heart-stoppingly beautiful shots. And they were so coked up in the control room that they cut them into 16-frame hunks. Yeah. So when, when we saw the broadcast, we were bitterly disappointed that... Mm. Nobody had the good sense to let a shot develop, you know, mm -hmm. and they were shots designed to develop and amaze and, you know, carry you forward. Mm -hmm. And they just couldn't resist cutting, cut, 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 cut. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Before we close, I just wanted to say to you that during my research, a friend of mine who works at the BBC, um, who's been very good to me in my little podcast here, because it's just me doing this. Um, he has interviewed everybody. And I said... Have you ever interviewed Garrett Brown? He said, I have. He said it was 1995. I went out to Philadelphia and I interviewed him out there. And there were two things. He sent me the transcript. There were two things that jumped out at me. You said in 1995, and I quote, and I used to joke back then, which has got to be 10 years ago, so 1985, that I would end up as the last of the real-time cowboys. Basically, I would end up my days on a blue screen set 
which is the way you do these optical things, just shooting faces with naked actors where all the wardrobe sets and props would be put in by ones and zeros. You've essentially come up with what's happening now, <laughs> all those yeah, years ago, wild. In the, for those Marvel movies. What prompted that remark mm. was seeing a film called The Last Starfighter. Yeah. The Last Starfighter was the first one that it was all CGI. It wasn't, you know, the models of the Dykstra flight. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know? Yeah, yeah. And real lighting was all ones and zero. Mm. And looking at that, I thought, damn. You know, <laughs> you know we're going to be, we're going to watch this happen when avatars get good enough to fool you. Mm. You know, Cameron gets away with his avatar avatars because they're so different physically that you can't nail them down. But nobody has quite yet made a, a fake human that mm. will fool you either with the Turing test over, you know, by audio means or by appearance. Mm. But they will. They mm. will. And that will be a shocking and scary thing you know, because they'll be much cheaper than actors. Mm. And if one of them becomes famous, you know, and has fans, stand back. Yeah, yeah. There's one other thing you said in this same interview. You're clearly a man with an eye in the future because you talked about a disembodied camera. And then you joked about how you would patent it and sell it to fast food companies so they can deliver junk food. <laughs> and there it is drones <laughs> it's happened um jesus yeah. christ you know incredible i mean i i even joke about the sky cam which is you know one could say why aren't they drones you know out there you could they're though they will be the size of bumblebees they'll be high mm. def 8k cameras stable as a church the size of a bumblebee mm. there'll be one for each player you know mm. and i joke that you know when that happens why would you want to why would you want a sky cam except that they'll have to issue the players badminton rackets to, you know, keep the drones away from themselves <laughs> while they play. You know? <laughs> yeah, I was recently working on the Formula One Qatar Grand Prix, and mm. they had a drone light display, which was drawing faces and doing a yeah. countdown from 10. And you just, you kind of look at it, Shocking. but you can't really take it in. It's just kind of mind boggling. You're, you can't quite perceive what it, you know, because yeah. you can't see the kit. You just kind of, I don't know. You kind of shrug at it. Yeah, it's amazing. shocking. Yeah, yeah, I saw a demo of that live, mm. and I couldn't believe it. Mm. Well, buckle up. You know, we're in for a, a really wild ride. Um, I don't know if you have any time left, but I'm I'm listening with great joy to a, a series of books written by a woman who wrote as Ellis Peters called Brother Cad Fail, and that ended up on TV with Derek Jacobi playing yes. the. The, the character but yeah. the books are a marvel yeah. and what's marvelous to me is is just comparing life in 1140 AD beautifully brought to life by her with this insane existence that we have now mm -hmm. insane on so many ways you know interhuman relationships you know polarized by media that pander to this faction or that faction and mm. and behaviors that you know, aren't are noticeably medieval in some respects. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, stand no, I think by. You're absolutely right. Well, Garrett, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I'm glad we finally managed to do this, and um, yeah, I really appreciate you giving your time and telling us your stories and your, you know, imparting your expertise and everything else. It's it's wonderful. Thanks, Dan. I enjoyed it. Good luck to you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.